Hello everybody, earlier in the year I put up a poll asking you which of the mid-engined Ferrari V8 regular road cars was your favourite and I have to say the results shocked me because by a country mile the 458 was the most popular. I know a lot of people would think that's because of the age of people who watch my channel but actually you'd be wrong because there is a really broad spread to my audience. We have people of all sorts of ages and locations watch the channel so there must must be something the 458 is really doing right. I then had the genius idea for Christmas to try and feature as many of the mid-engined V8 road cars as I could. Everything from the 348 to the 488. But the one which proved most difficult to get a hold of was the 458. So with time running out, I put a quick phone call into my automotive fairy godmother, Damien from the Car Guys, who came up Trumps and drove nearly 200 miles to come to me so that I could sample this car on some of my very favorite roads. So, in honour of him, before we get started, a quick watch check. No, and now, onto the car. Because of the way that YouTube and my life works, we've done things in a very strange order, because this was actually the final video to be filmed, and tomorrow's, the finale, was actually the first. Now, today is not going to be an in-depth review of this car, because we don't have the time or the weather for it. If you want to know more about it, what it's been like to own, please do check out the Car Guys channel. If you want to see more on cars like this and many others, they've got a very nice collection and they are nothing if not honest about them all. This, in fact, is a particularly special car because Damien picked it up from new. He didn't spec it, but he got it from Meridian Modena in 2015. So it's a very late example of a 458, and it's been in his collection ever since. So clearly, he has a real affection for this car. And we're going to talk to him after I've done my drive to see just why it is that it's managed to stay around for quite so long. Even at more than a decade old, it's still actually a pretty fresh looking car and it has a place in history as one of the final designs penned for Ferrari by Pininfarina, everything after this being done in-house. Now as ever with Ferrari, aerodynamics were at the forefront of all the changes that they made. And there's a lot of things that they were very proud of, like these little flexible ducts at the front that deform as speed increases to try and reduce the frontal drag. There's holes and scoops and shapes everywhere, although notably, they haven't got any big air intakes on the side. And I think that's something of a disappointment because I'm a bit old school. I see supercar and I think big air intake on the side. Instead with this, Ferrari grabbed air for the car from underneath and above. Very clever, but this is the car for me where Ferrari start to go away from styling cars and more engineering them. The rear end saw equally dramatic changes. The classic Ferrari quartet of lights was replaced with these two single ones either side. Down here, you have a little nod to the F40 with the trio of exhausts. The engine is a development of the earlier 4.3 litre seen in the F430, here bored out to four and a half litres and producing 562 brake horsepower. Now, one other thing that was lost, tragically in the eyes of many, was the option of a manual gearbox. Here, your sole transmission option was a seven-speed dual-clutch item, replacing both the manual and the automated manual F1 shift that Ferrari had used before. This wasn't actually the first Ferrari with a dual-clutch. That honour, in fact, went to the California. And this uses similar hardware, but with some significant revisions to make it more in keeping with this kind of car. The interior was likewise a massive departure from all of their previous models. And in fact, it probably looks quite familiar to anyone that's looked in a more recent Ferrari because this is essentially the template that has been used for every car since. This little pair of screens with a central tachometer is the same formula Ferrari are still using in the F8 now. Your buttons for gears are down here, and the 458 also introduced this chappy, the steering wheel with all the buttons on it. Now, to hold, it is a beautiful thing, but it's not perfect in its execution. The Manatino switch is carried over pretty much unchanged from the 430 and is a really nice thing to have. You have here in the 4582 the bumpy road mode, which was introduced in the 430 Scud. But you've also got the indicator controls here, and they're just, well, a little bit rubbish and annoying. The paddles are where they've always been on a Ferrari, mounted to the column, so they don't move. It's a tricky little system to get used to, and the honest truth is this, because I've driven now a few cars with this layout, and you will get used to it, but on day three, 
and then as soon as you get out of it, you'll try and indicate in your other car by tooting the horn or changing the radio station. It's frustrating and it's one thing that I think Ferrari didn't really need to do, but somehow they felt that it was a, a good idea and they have fully committed. But I suppose it's now become an iconic piece of Ferrari design. That steering wheel incidentally is connected to a steering system which is 30% faster than in the 430. This was designed to be a pretty sharp car. Ferrari also put some effort into trying to make this car even more usable day to day. It was one of the first vehicles they sold with their seven year free servicing plan. So I can't tell you how much it costs to service one of these because in the five years Damien's had it, he hasn't actually had to pay for servicing yet. There have been a few other issues though. The corrosion warranty on the car is only four years and there have been some corrosion issues which have needed sorting. The bodywork had some and the wheels are also starting to go too, which is unfortunate. At one point, prices for 458s looked certain to drop below the £100,000 mark, but they stopped, swiftly did a U-turn, and have been climbing ever since. They've then come back down a little bit, so I imagine there's a lot of people out there wondering whether now is the time to get into one of these. Particularly confusing is the fact that at the top end of the 458 market, there is a lot of crossover with 488 prices, and that's a car that on paper is a lot newer, with a lot more performance. So. Can this, the last of the naturally aspirated mid-engined regular Ferrari V8s, actually be that good? Time, I suppose, to find out. Making a video of a car such as this, with the kind of reputation that it has, is always a difficult task. It's going to go only one of two ways, really. Either I love it, and people will tell me that I only say that because that's what everyone else says, or I don't love it, and then I'm told I'm just being difficult and controversial, and, and how could I say that when everybody else would disagree with me? So with this car, I'm simply gonna talk you through it as it comes to me. My first thoughts, wow, that steering is really quick and that gearbox is really slick. If you're used to the old F1 box cars like the 430, this is night and day better. Now we'll get on soon to find out whether it's really that much slower than the modern versions, but if you were used to the old F1 cars, this is a vast improvement. Certainly if you want to use it in automatic mode where it will quietly shuffle all the way to seventh before you've even noticed. Really is a smooth and very good gearbox. The car also to me feels somewhat more connected to the road than the 430. In that I never quite trusted the steering. And although here it's certainly much more hyper than it really needs to be, in fact it's really quite mad, I think I've got a little bit more faith in the chassis. Speaking of which, I'm driving the car currently in sport mode and I haven't even pressed the bumpy road mode button and it is immaculately well damped. I would say this is actually a far more plush car than the 488. This really is quite comfortable. And with bumpy road on, it's magnificent. It really is spectacularly well controlled, this thing. At the front, Ferrari had a development of the double wishbones that they've been using for a while, but with a new arrangement. At the rear, they introduced a multi-link setup, which is a bit of a departure from the double wishbone they were using previously. It's not the easiest thing to just get in and go. Yes, the driving element of it is perfectly fine and simple, but the controls of all the screens and all that sort of jazz are not easy and they're certainly not intuitive. This is not a car that you want to try and learn when you're on the move. That being said though, the actual driving aspect of it though couldn't be simpler. Visibility is pretty good, not quite as spectacular as some of their older cars, particularly 355, 348 and so on, but it's very good by supercar standards nonetheless. Seems to steam up quite easily this car and I've no real idea why because I do have the AC and everything on but hopefully it will sort itself. So the box isn't as fast as the modern one, certainly not when you're pressing hard but these often change as you do get a little bit more aggressive with them. The exhaust note isn't perhaps quite as sonorous as that as you'll find in an old Ferrari either. You know what, I'm going to have to drop the window, and this being a Ferrari, it's never as simple as you think. The tyres are quite cold. 
and at lower gears this thing as you might have seen rather squarely I am in sport mode still and it will let you get quite sideways before intervening a lot of fun this thing it's pretty cold out there so I'm gonna exercise some caution it's not scary or intimidating or anything of the sort really My throttle response is pretty damn good though is really linear perhaps even to a fault I mean it makes its peak at 9,000 rpm something that Ferrari in their press release claimed it was the first road car to do that the Honda S2000 yes so the DCT box I'd say it's in line with the early PDK that Porsche putting in the 997 a great leap on what came before but not the lightning fast system that we know now gonna turn the car into a race mode for my sins keep it in bumpy road and see if that sharpens thing up a touch. Or the exhaust valve opens much earlier in race. The steering doesn't really weight up in the way that I would like it to. There's no reward for taking it to nine. That's really disappointing. I'd hoped that it would have some sort of second wind. The 991.1 GT3's engine went to about the same, and that, from 7 to 9,000 RPM, just becomes an entirely different animal to the engine it is before then. Here, it's just pure, straightforward power all the way through the rev range. It's reasonably punchy in the mid-range. It's no turbocharged unit. It's not like a McLaren, but it's certainly flexible on days like this where the road conditions are not brilliant and your concentration levels are high where things like the indicators being in silly places just aren't helpful at all <laughs> in slow this car in slow at all i do like the steering but i don't love it it just doesn't talk to me. It doesn't have that unbelievable level of communication you'll find in, say, a McLaren 570S or 600LT. And in fact, it's not even as good, I would say, as a 650S or a 720S. So often a Ferrari weak point. However, that being said, the brakes I do really like. In some more recent Ferraris, I found the ceramics, which by the time they made this became standard fit, to be just a little bit too grabby, just a little bit unnecessary. But here, actually, I find them quite easy to modulate. In fact, I'd forgotten that this had ceramics on it at all. Oh, this is a great thing to pedal. You've got to watch out for that rear because it will turn around on you. Now, unlike McLaren, Ferrari did stay with a mechanical differential of sorts, what they called their E-diff. And you do build some faith in it. <laughs> On a day like today, even an upshift will cause the back end just to just to kick ever so slightly. Not daunting, not scary, just something to note. You don't want to be giving it full bore upshifts on a bend in these conditions, that's for sure. What is it that I expected the 458 to be like? I really don't know. It's so difficult when people just constantly, for over a decade, tell you how utterly brilliant something is to really turn that into something tangible, with expectations that it could possibly meet. And has this met them? I don't know. I've only really been driving it for actually a, a few minutes, but you do get a real feel for the car. I am genuinely enjoying it. The weather today was actually promised to be a little bit sunnier and nicer than it actually has been. I'm very, very grateful to Damien for bringing it out to play because a lot of other people have already tucked their 458s away for the winter and they shan't see those until April, I'd have thought, at the very earliest. Not him. He really is a car guy. I went for the indicator again. I'm not going to find it there, I tell you. Steaming up again. Steaming up again. I promise you I'm not doing anything salacious in this car. Oh, and there's reverse. It's, that's a little bit slow to engage. Nope, no, and now it's little things like this. The window control is not working quite as you'd like them to. Oh, you devil. 
Corrosion aside, Damien actually hasn't had any real mechanical issues with these cars. I know they became quite famous early on for some thermal incidents that they suffered. That was due to some glue in one of the rear wheel arches, which meant that the lining dropped out and that then caught fire. Nothing quite as catastrophically mechanically wrong as with, say, the 911 GT3, but still rather embarrassing to see your product going up in flames very publicly. That is not something I'd really be concerned about whatsoever, and indeed the 458 has proven to be actually a pretty robust and decent model. By the time they made this, Ferrari seemed to have stopped publishing numbers for models made, but it's fair to say that they probably sold quite a few more of these than they did the 430. That means that although they're still commanding a pretty reasonable price, there are a lot of cars in the classifieds for you to choose from. These beautiful seats, for me, would be a must-have. They are lovely, they are supportive, but they're actually quite comfortable too. I'd probably go for the carbon interior, and it's a disappointment that there's quite a few pieces in here which you simply could not have in carbon, and so they're just that sort of weird rubbery plastic that Ferrari like to use. In fact, some earlier 458s still suffered with the same weird sticky switch syndrome that my 550 does. I don't like quite how annoyingly vocal the car tries to be in race mode and so on and so forth. This is a problem I've had with a few different Ferraris. I'd actually like it that they were a little bit more predictable. You know, just make it so that above 4,000 RPM it makes a noise or, or something like that. Or give me a button where, like bumpy road mode, I can tell it whether I want it to be loud or not. Ferrari, though, never really kind of went in for that sort of thing. What is important though is that it is fun to drive. Cars like this, which really are quite a technological tour de force, can often be, well, the opposite. There's so much going on under the skin that sometimes you feel like you've been robbed of a little bit of the experience. Here I think Ferrari's know-how really does shine through because all of that electronic trickery just serves to give you more confidence in the car. And this is somebody else's very expensive plaything. It's seven degrees out there. This is a car with over 560 horsepower and I'm quite happy to turn the traction control into its sort of half-off mode because I've got the confidence in it. That's not something I'll do that often. I am no driving god. I am no Chris Harris. I am no Henry Catchpole. I will quite happily admit that. I'm just a man who really likes cars. And so it's very important that something like this is somewhat friendly and approachable. It means that actually you find yourself more confident to explore its limits rather than just living in fear of it. Of course it has plenty of faults. It rides a little bit too high. It's still ruddy misting up in here even though it's got absolutely no reason to do that. These screens down here are nearly impossible to navigate without at least a two-day course. Like all Ferraris, this thing is impossibly thirsty at all times. The indicators on the wheel were just something very unnecessary that nobody asked for and nobody still wants, but Ferrari persevered. However, to criticise this car for that, I think, is to misunderstand not the point of a Ferrari, but the point of a supercar. I think, actually, it's a much more valid thing to criticise in, say, a Portofino or the Roma, because that is a car that is designed to be used every single day. And their ergonomic failings, such as these, are of much greater significance. There really aren't that many 458s out there with big miles on them, despite all the effort that Ferrari goes to, to make sure that they are cars, which, indeed, you can tour with. The boot is very generously sized, actually, there's loads of room in it. I've got an R8 on the driveway at the moment, and I'd say you can comfortably fit nearly twice as much in this as you can in the boot of that. The last car of Damien's that I drove was his Gallardo Balboni, and it was certainly an experience. But if he'd brought that out and said to me, James, do you want to leave it on the driveway for a week? I'll take the 550 home. I would have said politely, thanks, Damien, but also no thanks. However, if he made the same offer with this, Oh yeah, all day long, Damien, can I please borrow this car for a week because I really want to get to know it better. Of all the people that voted in my poll for the 458, I'm not sure how many of them have actually driven one. I suspect it's probably fairly few. But for those who may one day get the chance to do it, I don't think you're going to be very disappointed. This really is a very special car. And... That's enough from me for today, but I want to hand you over now to Damien, who's going to talk a little bit more from his perspective of what makes this car quite so special. Thanks for watching.
Bye bye. So the, the only Ferrari that I had before this one was actually my 355 Spider. So that was my first ever Ferrari and my dream car. And then after that, that was obviously a used car, but then I had the option of getting the 458. So for me, I wasn't interested in the 458 at all when it was first launched. To me, Ferrari had got rid of the manual gearbox. So I was like, nope, I'm not having that. Uh, I'm not gonna get one of these cars. And I stayed away throughout the whole life of this car. And then the moment that they said they were going to stop doing the 458, I desperately suddenly wanted one. So I just rushed out and immediately bought this one. I've used this car every day. This has been my everyday Ferrari, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, it's gone everywhere. I, it's trips to the shops. It's around the country. Uh, it's been on loads of different road trips. The thing that I like about it is it's just so usable. It's very comfortable. It's crazy if you want it. It's got lots of storage inside, which you know obviously is good if you're going on long journeys. But it can be it can be relaxing if you want. It can set your hair on fire if you want. It's just the all-round package. And then of course you've got that great V8 soundtrack as well. So for me, I always wanted a car that I could use it a lot. And this car has been all over the country, and it's been on every every journey you can imagine, from track days to mundane shopping trips. It's done it all. I think I would still prefer it to have a manual gearbox if it could. Uh, I do hark back to that. It's one of the reasons why I've considered getting one of the last manual 430s, because I do love that open gated polished shifter. But apart from that, I think it does everything fantastically. I don't think there's anything I would change about this car. Compared to the Speciale, I would say it's everything that the 458 Italia is, but with an extra 25% of everything. So noise, sensation, steering, all the things that make this a great car, the Speciale just turns it up to 11, just makes it that little bit better in every area. So that's why I think the Speciale is probably the greatest modern Ferrari that they've ever made. Compared to the 488, the 488 to me feels, it feels a lot more numb. It feels a lot heavier. Does The responses are dulled in almost every area. It's a lovely car. It's put together well, but it doesn't have anything like the zingy performance or the character or the soul. It's a lot less playful than the 458. The 458 is actually quite a loose car. You can play with it. You can throw it around. 488 is a lot more jammed down on the road. It's a lot faster but it's a lot less engaging. To me, this is the perfect spec that I wanted at the time. Not everyone can handle a white Ferrari. Not everyone wants a white Ferrari. But for me, when I saw it, that glistening pearlescent paint, the dark roof, I just thought it looked so sharp and I never thought I'd have a white Ferrari, but I, there's nothing about this car that I would change. I think it's absolutely perfect, which is why I've kept it for five years. I did say in a recent video of mine that I was probably going to sell it. I think I, I think I might keep it forever, actually. And, and I've done 16,000 miles in this car. So, you know, this has been a properly used Ferrari. 16,000 miles. Most Ferraris never even get to that mileage, where it takes them 20 years to get to that. I've, I've used this a lot, and I've enjoyed every single mile.